Good morning. Woo. Um, my name is Sarah, and that microphone was probably set for people who have a normal volume. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll hold it further away. I, um, I'm sharing this morning, but I want to introduce myself because I don't actually work here. You might not know me. Um, I do go to church here. This is my home church uh, for almost 20 years. I'm what we call like a fake guest speaker because I come from the church, but about a couple times a year I get to share up here. During the week, I'm a third grade teacher in a public school. I'm married. I have two kids. Um, I still use paper notes when I talk. I'm not great with technology. And if you've texted me, I'm not trying to ignore you. I probably lost my phone. <laughs> so it's nice to meet you. Like I said, Monday through Friday, I teach third graders. And I love teaching third grade. I asked to go to third grade. I like that developmental age where they are. Most of them can tie their own shoes. Um, I, I like the content I do in third grade. Third grade is like the introduction to multiplication and division. So from like the second week of September until Thanksgiving, I walk around with a ukulele strapped on and we have like math fact songs um, that the kids are sick of, but then they know them. Um, I get to be the one who reads them books like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and they're old enough to appreciate that. And third grade has really good science units. We do uh, weather and wolves, and now we do butterflies, which I could really take or leave, because last year I realized that butterflies are pretty, but caterpillars are gross. <laughs> and, and not all caterpillars make it all the way through that life cycle chart. So you end up with like a little more than you bargained for talking about insect mortality. And when we finished the unit, I offered second grade $100 to take it back and they said no. So I still teach butterflies. Ugh. But every year in third grade, somewhere between Thanksgiving and Valentine's Day, I teach the kids what I tell them is their most important lesson of the school year. And I don't, like, it's not on the calendar. I wait for them to need it. And every class eventually needs it. And I wait and I watch. Because after September and after the shiny excitement of, like, new teacher and new friends and new school supplies, it wears off. And I have these little indicators I see, like the tattling picks up. Um, lining up for PE becomes, like, World War 17. The, like, the tone of their voices with each other starts to change. Their fuses get shortened. It happens every year. And when it does, I cancel one day of our spelling and phonics program, which gives me like 25 or 30 minutes, and I teach them a lesson called How to Have a Good Fight. And we make a poster about how to have a good fight. I did not make this up. It's from a program I learned in college, but I give them a script and it literally says, when you, hmm, it made me feel, hmm, I want you to, hmm. And the kids practice it. And they practice it on each other for different scenarios. So when you cut me in line, it made me feel sad. I want you to go back to your spot. When you took the soccer ball, it made me angry. I want you to give it back. Like, remember, they're eight, so this is about what we can handle. Like, when you called me that name, it made me sad. I want you to say sorry. And part of what I say to them is a good fight is not a fight you win. A good fight is when you were able to say what was bothering you, they were able to respond, and we go back to being a productive learning community. It's not a good fight because you won. It's a good fight because it was worked through. And we, in Western culture right now, have reduced the idea of conflict to who won then and who lost, instead of we're restoring this from the break and then we're going forward together. So a good fight doesn't necessarily have a winner. A good fight is one where you're able to reconnect and go forward. And I, I do hope that my students learn fractions and their math facts, and I hope they learn how to spell, um, because all of that is good, and it matters for their life. But nothing in my content will impact their life as much as if they learn to actually 
handle conflict in a healthy way. Because really, like marriage, that's a partner work assignment where you picked your partner and your partners for a long time. Have you ever tried to assemble furniture with your spouse? (laughs) Partner work got you ready for that. Adult life is basically one giant group project. So it turns out that it's not actually that hard to start something. Starting things is exciting. People start friendships and they start nonprofits and they start clubs and they start companies. It is very hard to sustain things over time. And one of the main reasons for that is that over time, any group of people will experience conflict because it's human nature. So if you have a group of people, you have conflict. Now, I actually really love reading the Bible. And I know that's not true for everyone, but legitimately, that's how my brain works. And lest you think I'm bragging or being super spiritual, it's very hard for me to sit still and pray. And I'm very easily distracted in worship songs. So I'm not like a spiritual giant person. That's not what I'm saying. I just, I really like reading the Bible. I think it's interesting to see how people for thousands of years have learned about what God is like. And I really like the way the Bible gives insight into what people are like because human nature doesn't change. And as the creator and as the father, God understood who we were gonna be and how we were gonna relate to each other. And so when we're going through the book of Matthew, which is what church has been doing for a while now, there's a teaching from Jesus that's super direct and super practical about how to handle the conflicts that are going to happen. Because I like the practical parts and I like the useful parts. And if you are in a conflict right now, this might be helpful. And if you're not in a conflict, you will be. Unless you like live in a tent in the middle of nowhere, in which case it's odd that you're here. (laughs) So, Even if you don't need it now, you will. And Jesus made it very simple and it's very clear. It's it's an organized system, a step-by-step for how to do this in a healthy way. So we're gonna look at Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20. It'll be on the screen, but I'm also gonna read it to you. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. He listens to you, you've gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. Truly, I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two of three of them are gathered in my name, there I am among them. So I'm going to tell you a a story about church. And it is my story, so it's a little bit personal. And um, hang with me. So in March of 2020, when the world shut down for the COVID pandemic, we, like most of you, pivoted our entire lives in a weekend. And now we were both working from home and suddenly we were educating our kids from home and we were making brand new decisions with a brand new reality. And by summer, by the time summer came that year, which it came really late that year, Our family was kind of sick of our house, kind of sick of germs, kind of sick of each other. And one thing that was a little unique about our family is my husband, Jonathan, works in a church. He's on staff here, and I work in a school, a public school. And two institutions that people had very, very strong opinions about the reopening were churches and schools from both sides. So both of us were hearing it in very strong terms from both sides of the argument at both of our places of employment. And by the time the weather warmed up that year, so had my frustrations with hearing all of the criticism. 
So I handled it like a grown-up and I went shopping. <laughs> and I bought a bush. And I have brought you a picture. I mean, that was a while ago. It's beautiful. Um, when it's in its full glory, this bush is the pride and joy of my backyard. It is a coral-colored knockout rose bush, is what it's called. I do buy organic rose food. I don't buy organic people food. So you can make of that what you want to. <laughs> I named my plant the Jonah plant because there's this story in the Bible where Jonah, and it's a long story, but Jonah goes on this whole journey and God has told him to go to this city, Nineveh. And Jonah's supposed to tell the people, you're doing wicked and terrible things and you need to turn and repent and listen to God. Jonah eventually goes and tells them that and incredibly the people do. They turn and they repent and they listen to God and you would think that Jonah would be so excited about that, that that would be a celebration, but you would have thought wrong. Jonah was offended by God's mercy to these people. He wanted to see them get blown up. And the fact that God was gonna forgive them offended him. So he, there being no shopping centers nearby, went out into the desert and sulked. And in the story, God allows this plant to grow and the plant gives Jonah shade. And Jonah loves the plant and he's thankful for the shade. And then God kills the plant and Jonah is distraught. How could you kill my plant? And basically God says to Jonah, really? A plant? You loved the plant more than you loved these people? And the day I put that rose bush in, I said to my husband, I love this plant more than I love God's people right now. <laughs> and that is why the rose bush is called the Jonah plant. And it was a joke, but it was a funny, not funny joke. Have you ever heard a, told a funny, not funny joke? Like it's a joke, but it's actually coming from a place that's like still hurting. It was still, it was, it was like seeping up from my frustration with the church in America, with what we were, with what I had hoped we were going to be, and if I could even fit into it anymore, or really if I even wanted to. Because the kingdom of heaven, right before this passage, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven is the design that God had. And the church on earth, this is the reality of what we live in right now. We learn kingdom of heaven values and we pray for the kingdom of heaven to come. But right now, the church on earth, each other, this is what we have for this journey together. And God, because he is kind and patient, walked me back so that I could understand that again. And so that I could love the vision of the church on earth. And I want to tell you that part too. So the first thing that happened was I read a book called A Fellowship of Difference by Scott McKnight. And some of you thought you were gonna make it all the way through one of my sermons without a book recommendation, but I actually just moved it halfway through. Um, this book um, taught me about the church by um, going through the book of Acts, which recounts like the early communities of faith, what eventually became the church. And it reminded me of things I knew but had forgotten. Like the church wasn't actually designed to be a club of people who would think and act all the same. It was set up to be more like a family so that all different sorts of people who just loved the same Jesus would then learn to love each other. And when we live that out, like the reality of being so different but loving the same Jesus, then we fulfill our call to show the world the hope of the gospel in real time. Because culture right now is, has built camps and lives in echo chambers. And everybody just fills their consciousness with voices that already agree with them. And when the church answers the call to be above that, to be a community of people that are totally different and that's okay, that you and I have different socioeconomic backgrounds. You probably don't agree with me on politics. We're interested in different things, all of it, but we're here together to follow Jesus together, to show the love of Jesus to the world together. And we don't have to agree on everything. I get to be me, you get to be you. That's how God made us. And we're gonna do that together. Next thing that happened was in January then of 2021, 
church reopened small groups. And I said I would lead one of them. And that year we all did a book called Rooted. And as part of that Bible study, there was a week that really focused on the spiritual practice of repentance and conviction. So I prayed and I asked God what I was doing wrong. And it was what church people would call conviction, which is a nice spiritual word for being told you're doing something wrong. Um, And it was pretty uncomfortable, but essentially I felt like God made it clear to me how much bitterness was in my heart. And now I had let the frustration and the anger from the criticisms grow. And I understood, so we have like front landscaping and back landscaping, and we get these weeds in our front that look like they're this big, and then you pull it up and the thing trails for like eight inches. It goes like a brrrr. It's very satisfying. But that's what had happened. Like to me, my frustration and my anger at the church, big church in America, looked about this big, but it was clearly a more pervasive and extensive problem than I understood. So I repented, which is a church word for saying that I was sorry. I owned the fact that I was angry and I prayed that God would give me a new and different heart and a new and different outlook. So that rooted group that started in January of 2021, that is still my small group. And some people have joined and some people have left, but we're still around. And since then, that has become like my spiritual community, like a micro expression of the church, the big church. And our group is very different from each other. Um, Our age range alone is from 22 um, up to, they would kill me if I told you. (laughs) But they love talking about their grandkids. And I am sure that we did not all see the pandemic the same way, and we probably don't all vote the same way, but we don't really talk a lot about that. We love Jesus, and we have learned to love each other. Because the point of the church wasn't that we were gonna be like an interest-based club and that we would become more and more alike. That wasn't the point. It was that we were gonna be ourselves, but those differences were gonna work together to make a strong community and bring the gospel out into the world. Which sounds really nice, but then here's the truth. If we're different and we're allowing differences, then we'll disagree. And when there's disagreement, a lot of time there's hurt. And what then? And were you nervous I was not going to come back to the Bible? Because my story was so long. All right, let's go back. So in Matthew 18, starting in verse 15, Jesus addresses this beginning that a diverse community of sinful people is going to have conflict. So we don't have to be surprised by that. We can expect it. It's okay a diverse community where we're different from each other of sinful people. Sinful is just the church word for not perfect in violation of the way it should have been. We're going to have conflict. It can help just to know that that's not like terrifying. That's expected. Jesus then goes on to um, verse 15 and starts with, there is a healthy approach to conflict. Verse 15 says, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him your fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So step one in Jesus' very clear plan is you go directly to the person who hurt you. You're clear and you're honest. And the goal is not winning. The goal is reconciliation. If If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. That's the winning. A direct and personal and honest approach is not the cultural norm for an argument. Even just at work, I'll see there's a conflict and somebody gets their feelings hurt and almost never does that person go directly to the person who hurt them and address it personally and directly. It's more like this like chattering begins, like both sides go and tell other people their side of the story and try to get a little support base for the conflict. And that can be like comforting if you're hurt and sad, but it does not move anything forward. It will not move the conflict forward. It will not move the community forward. Jesus says, 
very clearly that when you're hurt, you go straight to the person who hurt you, not you go and start establishing a little social army to back you up. So practically, in our small group, um, one semester, I made a decision about how we were structuring group that really hurt one of the people in our group. And it really affected how she was experiencing group and how she was able to connect to other people. And she had obviously a lot of options, one of them to be to go and tell everyone and see who agreed with her. But she emailed me and said, can I set up a time to talk to you on the phone? So we did, and she shared how what I had done had affected her, how it actually made her feel. Um, it wasn't like accusatory or critical, like she didn't assume I had tried to hurt her. It was just a very honest and fair explanation of how what I had done had affected her. And just to address it, she's not even a person who likes conflict. Like I know some people are like in it for the fight. She's not one of those people. But because she did that the right way, she's still a part of that community and so am I. And she and I are still friends and in that community together. And the whole group got healthier and better because she did it the healthy way. See, there's no shortcut for this. If it's hurting you and it's a big deal, there's not a shortcut to handling that conflict in a healthy way. You have to be honest and you have to start with the person who hurt you. But actually watching that happen as we went through that was helpful for me. I think that most conflicts, not all, but most conflicts resolve at this step. If we really do, do go in humbly and honestly and, and in private, so there's, no, there's less defensiveness, um, with our, our goal being restoration, that we're gaining our brother back, a lot of conflicts resolve right here and they don't have to go any further. But you know and I do, that's not always true. And so Jesus said, there's a next step. There's a step two. Verse 16 says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So sometimes you did it and you were honest and you were direct and you were careful and it, the, it is not received and the situation does not resolve. And the gut instinct is gonna be to throw your hands up and say, well, I tried, I tried and quit. But remember, we're not fighting against our community, we're fighting for our community. And so then we stay engaged to step two, which is where you ask someone else to come be part of the conversation. In modern day terms, we usually call this mediation. Like we take a wise person who wants the good of everyone involved and they get involved in the situation, the way Jesus outlines it. Because you know and I know that when it's a conflict, and people are hurt, feelings start to run really hot and thought processes get cloudy. And so when you can bring in somebody who also wants the good of both parties and the community and will pray and will guide you, that can be a really productive um, step for resolving the conflict. Sometimes even after all that, even with the mediation and the extra voice, the situation doesn't resolve. Um, and then there's a, a leadership resource to help you. When you look at verse 17, Jesus goes and says, if he refuses to listen to them, this is the mediator and the other individual, tell it to the church. Now, to be clear, you're not telling it to the church like from the stage. We don't do that here. We don't do public humiliation and shame. This is... This is more like the church as in the church leaders. This is where you call and you set up like a meeting with a church staff member or an elder and you get their wisdom and you get their perspective on your situation. And this, this isn't where you start. This comes after a one-on-one -on -one conversation, after a mediation. This is a high level of intervention for conflict, but you do it because you care a lot and you really want the relationship to be restored if it's at all possible. And our church actually has amazing staff and elders. And if you walked out all these other steps, it's a blessing and a relief to know that you have this support also. It was supposed to be set up this way, that if you get to this point, you're probably tired and you're probably really hurt. 
and there are people at church because you're part of a faith community who will walk with you and help you and do everything they can to restore that relationship so you can be part of a healthy community together. And then after the one-on-one conversation, after the mediation, after you get the church leadership involved, here's the other part. There is a stopping point. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, a, a complete reading of the Bible would not allow you to believe that Jesus was saying Gentiles and tax collectors are bad things because Jesus did ministry to Gentiles. And when you continue into the New Testament, um, the last thing he says to the church is take the gospel to every nation and the Gentiles were welcomed into the church. And one of Jesus's disciples was a tax collector. So he's not saying that you push them out because they're bad people. In their culture, the Gentiles and the tax collectors existed separately. So he's saying if it gets to this point, and even with the church leadership involved, there's no restoration, then you have a separation. And we live a little separately. In modern terms, I think we would call that a boundary. Does that make sense? See, the problem is some people struggle to even hear that you have to engage conflict. Some of us naturally, when we get hurt, Our natural tendency is to disengage. We'll back up. We'll find a new friend. We'll find a new community. We don't want to lean in to the conflict. Some people, um, fighting is their instinct. And they will lean into the conflict, maybe not want to go through the steps in order. They lean into the fight. Some people have a hard time accepting this, that there is a point where it stops. Sometimes you've done all the steps, you've handled the conflict the healthiest way you could, but it takes two to tango. So here, Jesus, this is Jesus talking, is giving you the direction or the permission or however you need to hear it, that you can draw that boundary. A healthy boundary drawing in a situation like this allows you to walk free. It lets you keep growing in your faith. It lets you keep engaging in community because you know you did what you could to reconcile that with your brother or sister. In, um, in our school, we still do an old fashioned field day. Do you remember field day when you were a kid? Best day of June. It's like potato sack race and um, egg and spoon. And yeah, it's fun. But the, the culmination of field day, the what thing everybody waits for is tug of war. And when the kids sign up for tug of war, I, being a person of integrity and character, allow the children to sign up for whatever they want. I pull their little popsicle sticks and I say, what event, what event, what event? And invariably, these kids who are like 52 pounds and completely unathletic are like, I wanna play tug of war. And the people I work with, the other teachers are wonderful people and great educators, but they don't let the kids choose their tug of war team, they set it. They put all the big and athletic kids on their tug of war teams. And so every June we go out there and my class folds like an envelope. And tug of war is just an annual humiliation for us. But when I was thinking about this whole idea of of conflict and healthy conflict management, it is a little tug of war Like it's I share and you share and I listen and you listen and I suggest and you suggest. But there's a part where if the other team sets the rope down, the game is over. Nobody won, nobody lost, it's just over. If you go through all of these steps, there's a point where it stops. And what's cruddy about that is that you don't get the restoration. What's a huge blessing, if you know that, is that you also don't carry the responsibility anymore. You walk free. And you know that you did the best you could. And you get to go forward with your faith and your relationships. So healthy conflict management, like all those steps I just went through, that's for everybody. Anybody, any part of the world, any faith would benefit from the the way Jesus laid out conflict management there. But Jesus actually goes right from the part about conflict to talking about prayer. Because what's unique about this community is that we are the church. 
the church of God on earth, and we pray. Unlike most clubs or organizations, we pray with each other and we pray for each other. I am not pretending to understand the mystery of prayer. I believe I already shared that it's not a natural personal strength. But I have read so many places in the Bible that when we pray, God listens to us. One of my favorite parts of the Psalms is I will keep praying because you bend your ear down to listen to me. And when we gather together and we pray and God is here with us and he's listening, that's an amazing gift to us, to our community. Over the last few years, like all of you, our family had some specific discouraging things that were hard. And I actually don't use social media. It's not for me. But even if I had it, it was like the kind of thing I would not have put up. It wasn't things we shared super publicly. But the people who knew about them were my Bible study group that I met with, that I talked to. And they prayed with me. And they didn't try to solve my problems. They weren't the kind of solvable by like a brainstorm session, but they prayed for me. They prayed with me. They would email me during the week to ask how I was doing and, and to say they were still praying for our family. And that's part of the gift, right? It's not that we all think and are the same. It's that we have each other. We're not a special interest group. We're not a book club. We're not a hobby organization. We're a family because we love Jesus. We talk to Jesus. We encourage each other towards Jesus. Jesus is our centerpiece. Um, can the worship team come back out? Look alive, worship team. So when Jesus was telling us how to process life together, like how to be a community, what would eventually be called the church, he knew and prepared for the fact that we were going to have conflict because we are a diverse group of sinners. And he also knew that we were gonna need to pray for each other and to pray with and for each other because I think that there are many beautiful things about life, but I also think that life can be really cruel and painful. And sometimes it's just difficult and lonely. And he gave us this community, he gave us each other and the church as a gift, even if it is kind of a complicated one sometimes. So like six-ish years ago, um, on a Sunday morning, we were doing a service where Stephen Nichols and Mariah Nichols were being um, set up as the youth pastors. So that was really exciting. If you don't know Stephen and Mariah, it was like, it was great. Everyone was excited. They're amazing people of faith, great character. Everyone knew they were gonna lead really well. Um, and I had volunteered on that morning that they said Stephen was being installed, which apparently is the church word for starting a job. I don't know. I had said that I would go get flowers for Mariah to like welcome her to the staff team or whatever. I'm sure she doesn't even remember this. So I was driving to church with the flowers and all of a sudden I was like, what am I going to say when I give these to her? Like, what do you say? Like, do you say this will be fun? <laughs> Jonathan was the youth pastor for like five years, my husband, and it was really fun except when it wasn't. So I was like, well, I could say like, sorry about your nights and weekends, but that seems like a really poor on-ramp. So I finally landed on, I gave her the flowers and I said, welcome to ministry, this is worth it. And it has been. Everything I have ever sacrificed for a healthy community of faith, to be part of the church, on earth that moves the gospel forward has been worth it. Every conflict we've had to navigate, every time I have had to eat humble pie and say that I was sorry, every heartache was worth it for the privilege and the joy of being part of God's church on earth because that's what we get for it, for the headache and the heartache of conflict and pain and management. And, and we pray to each other, for each other, you know what we get for that? We get a safe place, not a perfect place, but we get a safe place. We get an ever-growing personal faith, which is just the church word for 
a deep and growing knowledge that God is with you and God is for you and that you can connect to God. We get the kind of friendships that shine like stars when the night is really, really dark. People who will pray for us and laugh with us and, and dream with us. And we get to go into our future with more confidence because we know that we're being cheered for at the same time as we're cheering for each other. And, and to have that kind of faith and those kind of friendships and that kind of confidence going into the future is the vision that, that Jesus gave us for this church. And it is absolutely worth it. And so that's what I'm leaving you with from the bottom of my very grateful heart. Thank you for being part of our church and for walking out conflict with faith and integrity and for praying with and for each other. There is no shortcut for any of this, but it is totally worth it.